Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I am the Adult Program Coordinator at the North Suburban YMCA. In that role, I bring a variety of programs to adults in our community, including brain games, social networking opportunities, donation drives, and the adult education series, which you are attending tonight. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's seventh virtual adult education series program with the North Suburban YMCA. Tonight's program is titled Treating Hand and Upper Extremity Pain, hosted by Dr. Kristen Shong. Dr. Shong is a board certified orthopedic surgeon with fellowship training in hand and upper extremity surgery, which means that he treats adults, adolescents, and children who have suffered injuries to the hand, wrist, elbow, and arm. From sports-related injuries to carpal tunnel syndrome to challenges for musicians, tonight Dr. Shang will discuss the importance of restoring form and function to people who rely heavily on their hands and upper extremities. Dr. Shang is committed to staying current on the latest advances and techniques in hand and upper extremity treatment. He works with his patients to explore minimally invasive treatment options whenever possible. On every rating site that I investigated, Dr. Shang received rave reviews about his calm demeanor, his patience, his ability to listen, and his willingness to take the time to answer questions. People even commented on working, or excuse me, on his terrific sense of humor, which I anticipate you will see this evening. Dr. Shang explains his philosophy of treatment as, we are surgeons by training, but listening to and understanding what our patients want makes the difference. Dr. Shang will be addressing your questions at the end of his presentation tonight, and I ask that you please keep your questions general as he will not be able to address individual concerns without individual consultation. When you do have questions Dr. for Dr. Shang, type them into the question section on your screen and I will receive them and relay them to him at the end of the program. If you submit a question, please know that we will do our best to answer it about 45 minutes from now. However, if it is too personal, I may not be able to include it for Dr. Shang to address. Thank you again for joining us this evening. We hope that you will learn a lot about treating hand and upper extremity pain from Dr. Shang. And now thank you, Dr. Shang, for taking the time to be with us tonight. And please take it from here. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Karen. That was overly kind of an induction, uh, an introduction. That was very nice of you. Thank you. Uh, Karen, can you see that? Can you see my screen here? I sure can. Looks great. All right. Sounds good. Well, let's get started. I'll disappear folks. now. <laughs> uh, so we are going to talk a little bit about har, uh, hand and arm uh, pain and the common causes and some treatments of that tonight. Uh, first off, big thank you uh, to the Y. Uh, this is a great series uh, of events and talks. Uh, hopefully many of you out there are taking advantage of uh, listening to many of them. Uh, lots of interesting stuff uh, going on. Uh, so thank you again for uh, inviting me out uh, this evening uh, to talk to you for a little bit. Uh, first off, hard to do a, a virtual uh, talk of any kind these days without kind of addressing the the uh, big uh, virus in the room here. I certainly, certainly hope uh, that everyone out there is uh, doing well uh, and staying happy and healthy. Uh, certainly, uh, it has been a weird, uh, very strange year. Uh, so hopefully things will uh, pick up from here. Uh, and again, hopefully everybody is doing well, but it gives us an excuse to uh, hang out in the uh, virtual realm uh, for a little bit. So uh, Karen already hit many of the highlights, which is which is great. Again, thank you very much. Uh, just a little quick background on me. Uh, I grew up in very rural Minnesota, uh, about three hours southwest of uh, the Twin Cities. So kind of down in this little corner here, a nice flat uh, area with uh, lots of farmland. Uh, and then I went to Carleton College uh, for undergrad, which is a small little D3 school. I played basketball there for a bit. Uh, and then spent a bunch of time here in Chicago, uh, University of Chicago for medical school, uh, and then ortho residency as well. And then uh, spent a short stint uh, out uh, east in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, out at Brown, uh, doing my hand and upper extremity uh, fellowship. Uh, so fellowship trained there. Again, like Karen said, I see it's fun to see all ages, adults and peds. Uh, and I do see folks out of a couple of our locations, mostly out of the Glenview office and the Wilmette office. So kind of in that North Shore neck of the woods. Uh, so the goals tonight, uh, we are going to hopefully discuss a few uh, interesting topics. They are some of the most common topics that I end up seeing in clinic uh, quite often, uh, or uh, a lot of questions that I get about these topics as well. So hopefully we'll understand a little bit about the anatomy, a little bit about the pathology or what goes wrong uh, with uh, the uh, body, and then the treatment uh, for some of these uh, common uh, injuries. 
uh, as well. Uh, if anybody has seen me give a talk before, uh, this is always how I start things. Uh, I am a huge heavy metal fan. Uh, so th if anybody wants to hang out and listen to music, uh, if you want to talk about medicine, that's fine. But if anybody wants to hang out and listen to music as well, I'm always down for that. Uh, this is the big four. Uh, if anybody knows of the big four, these are the four main thrash metal bands uh, that started the thrash metal movement back in the day, the kind of the early 80s. So those are, of course, uh, Metallica, up top, uh, have to be, uh, Megadeth, Slayer, and Anthrax. Uh, so those are, again, the big four uh, thrash metal bands. I usually take that big four concept and you can apply it to many different things uh, in, in your life. But in each talk, I usually take a big four uh, topic presentation and, and turn it into kind of fun things, just to try to keep things interesting. Uh, I've done things with Game of Thrones back in the day and, and Avengers and all sorts of fun things. Uh, but tonight, uh, in honor of my dear mother, who recently had a, a birthday, uh, we are turning the big four into the me big four. Sounds very narcissistic, but it's more self-deprecating than anything. Uh, but uh, the me big four is going to split up my life into four fun little eras uh, here. We start all the way over here on the left. Uh, with uh, the adorable era, what I'm calling the adorable era, my mother probably thinks. So this is me in the middle. Uh, I'm in later hosen and have a Santa hat on for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why. I think I was supposed to be a Christmas elf. I'll have to ask my mom about that. That was for Halloween. Uh, and then we move on uh, to, it just goes downhill from there, folks. We go from the adorable phase to uh, the different phases of bands that I've been in. So again, I'm a huge heavy metal fan, but I also played in a bunch of heavy metal bands or hard rock bands uh, over the years. So we started way back in high school uh, in the Goodfellow era. Goodfellow was our kind of high school band. Uh, this is me uh, in some sort of vinyl duster. Evidently, that was a cool thing in high school. We thought we were pretty tough and hard. Uh, and then we went on to college. And we played on a little label that we kind of created and we lived in a, a junky little apartment uh, in uh, Minneapolis and I took a year off from college. Somehow my parents allowed me to do that. Uh, and we created a band called Preacher Row, uh, which is a play on an old uh, uh, baseball player's name. Uh, but that was our, our heavy phase and we grew our hair out and we were headbanging all over the place playing flying Vs. Uh, and then I got old, unfortunately. So now I play in a fun little uh, uh, cover band uh, nowadays called Sincerely Sarlacc. Uh, bonus points for anybody who recognizes Sarlacc as being a deep cut kind of Star Wars character. Uh, that's the big sand pit that Boba Fett gets eaten by, if anybody wants to know or cares. Uh, but yep, that's me uh, getting older. Uh, the, the guitar just gets slung lower and lower, and I just end up standing in more of a spread eagle phase for some reason as I get older. So I, I cringe to see what I'll be doing when I'm 80 years old. Uh, but yep, that's the me big four. But tonight, uh, we're going to take that big four concept uh, and turn it into a slightly dorkier orthopedic big four uh, and go through some of our topics here. Uh, the first topic we'll talk about is uh, trigger finger, uh, and we'll kind of go through the anatomy and, and treatments of those, uh, plus a bonus topic, which is a fun one to talk about that often gets confused with trigger fingers. Uh, we'll go through some thumb arthritis, which is super, super common. Uh, we'll go through carpal tunnel syndrome, which is also ridiculously common uh, in the hand and upper extremity uh, uh, world. Uh, and then if we have a little bit of time at the end, I'll go through some tennis elbow. Uh, so we kind of hit the main uh, big high points of things that click, uh, things that hurt with the arthritis, and then things that are numb and tingly with the carpal tunnel syndrome as well. Um, but we'll kind of start from there. So topic number one, uh, going into the trigger fingers. Again, very common. Uh, many of you uh, probably have either had a trigger finger uh, or have a early trigger finger and aren't really sure what, uh, what it is. Uh, but uh, the trigger fingers, uh, we make everything, if, if you've ever gone to a doctor's office, we make things sound way fancier than it actually is. Uh, so the trigger fingers are actually called stenosine tenosynovitis, which we make it sound uh, way cooler than it, than it tries to be. Uh, but it basically is when your finger clicks or locks, that's the triggering part. Uh, many of you may have, you go to make a fist, and then when you try to open your fingers up, the finger will click as it opens uh, back. Uh, and that occurs because of kind of a mismatch uh, in size, which we'll get to in a sec about the, uh, the, the mismatch in size between the tendons that let you make a fist and then the tunnel system uh, that those tendons uh, flow through. So this is kind of a diagram of one of our fingers. 
it's basically looking at it as if we were looking at the side of your finger. Uh, so four main bones in the finger. The first is the metacarpal, which is your hand bone. And then each finger outside of the thumb, uh, each finger has three separate bones. So it's the proximal, middle, and the distal phalanx. Uh, those three bones kind of stacked on top of each other. And then on the bottom of our finger, we have two main tendons that help you make a fist. Uh, so they'll pull your fingers down. And when everything's working perfectly, we don't even think about it because it happens flawlessly. Uh, but those tendons are gliding through a fun little tunnel system. You can think about it exactly like a, uh, a train going through a tunnel gliding back and forth. So when it works, it works, it's lovely. But when it starts not to work, uh, it starts to cause uh, trouble for us. So what ends up happening is that something somewhere along the line causes some in localized inflammation uh, in, in and around those tendons. Uh, and then as we try to move our finger, that tendon glides back and forth and it carries the inflammation. And sometimes there's a little nodule that forms uh, and that uh, that nodule is kind of like a stowaway. You can think about it like a little stowaway on top of your train car. So as the train goes through that tunnel, it starts to click uh, against the little archway. Uh, and that causes not only pain and inflammation, uh, but it also gives you the uh, trigger uh, for the trigger finger. So uh, the most common digits, you can get these in any, any finger in your thumbs. You can get them anywhere, but the most common spots that we see them are in the thumbs. Uh, and also in the ring finger. Uh, but again, you can get them in all of the fingers. Uh, and I've seen many people who have uh, have had them uh, at different times in all 10 of the which is pretty uh, But uh, we, it's, it's very, very common. Uh, most of those trigger fingers are what we call idiopathic, uh, which again is just a fancy way to say that it's, uh, it, it, there doesn't, it doesn't have an actual cause uh, that you can link to. Uh, so it's not associated with any disease process or any particular activity. That's the most common one. They just kind of come out of the blue and your fingers start clicking uh, and, by, and bothering you. They certainly can be related to certain uh, uh, systemic diseases such as diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis, uh, some fancier ones like amyloidosis and sarcoidosis. Those are some fancy things. Uh, but diabetes is probably the most common one. Uh, folks with diabetes tend to uh, get trigger fingers a little bit more uh, easily uh, than folks without it. Uh, and you can also get something called a congenital trigger thumb, usually. They are usually in the thumbs, uh, but this is where little babies will get trigger uh, fingers or trigger thumbs. Uh, and this is uh, relatively common as well. Maybe some of you have had a, a child at one point that had this, uh, but it's usually where they'll, the little ones are born and their thumb will kind of be stuck down uh, like this and they can't extend their thumb back. Uh, most of them resolve on their own, uh, but sometimes it does require a little a little help on our end, uh, and it's either a little splinting or a, a little surgery to to affix uh, the little one's uh, thumb. Uh, we love we're dorks uh, in the hand world, so we love to classify everything. Uh, so this definitely has a classification system in it. Uh, again, it gets it gets deep divey in terms of being uh, extra fancy, but we basically split it up into four main categories. Uh, so category number one, the first stage is where you just have pain. This is kind of the pre-trigger phase where you don't get the clicking or the locking of the finger yet, but that's just painful in the palm. So if any of you are having pain underneath the knuckles, it's usually right underneath the main knuckle uh, in your hand. It's not really in the finger. You, it feels like the trigger is happening in the knuckles in your fingers, but that's just because the tendon that pulls those knuckles down is involved. But the actual sticking point or the trigger is underneath these knuckles, uh, underneath your palm. Uh, so that's pre-triggering phase. That moves on to phase two, which is the catching phase. And that's actually the trigger uh, part. That's where people will notice the finger clicking or locking, or you'll go to pick up your coffee cup uh, and you'll raise it up and, it, and then you put it down and your finger kind of clicks as you release it out. Uh, that moves on to an even more nuisance of a phase, uh, which is the, the locking phase. So that's where you'll go to grab something and you go to release it, but your fingers get stuck. So you have to passively pop it open with your other finger. That's very disconcerting. It makes people very uncomfortable and it can be quite painful uh, at times. Uh, and then stage four is rarer to get to. Uh, that uh, takes quite a bit of time to get to that, but that is the locked phase. So you go from pain to catching or triggering to locking all the way to a locked trigger finger, which is one where it will lock down into a fist. And no matter how you, hard you pull on it, you can't actually release it. Uh, so in those folks, uh, you often then end up needing to get to a surgery to uh, fix that. But again, stage four is pretty tough to get to.
uh, we, we end up seeing a lot of stage twos and stage threes where you're either just getting the clicking uh, or you're getting some of the locking. Um, so treatments, uh, many of the, uh, almost everything in orthopedics gets split down the middle between conservative uh, treatment or non-operative treatments, not doing any operations, uh, and then operative uh, interventions. So trigger fingers are no different. Uh, that gets split down the middle between conservative treatments and, and operative intervention. Uh, the conservative treatments run the gamut from simple things that you think about on your own, kind of the rice uh, treatment, where you're taking some anti-inflammatories, trying to get rid of some of that inflammation. Uh, you can do some occupational therapy for this. The, the uh, OTs or the occupational therapists are uh, the specialized therapists for hand and uh, upper extremity injuries, just like uh, the physical therapists uh, are specialized in backs and legs and, and, and uh, other areas. Uh, so that helps too. They can do fun little modalities to help things uh, loosen up and move. Uh, the book answer treatment for a trigger finger is a steroid injection. Uh, this is uh, an interesting treatment uh, from, uh, from an orthopedic standpoint because we use steroid injections for a lot of different things. Uh, many of you out there may have had injections for various other ailments or conditions in the past. Uh, but um, in the case of trigger fingers, uh, steroid injections can actually be a cure for it. Uh, most of what we'd use steroid injections for are either pain relief or for arthritic joints. Uh, and at that point, the, the steroid isn't going to necessarily change the bone or change the arthritis, uh, but it makes you feel a little bit better and can buy you some time. In the case of a trigger finger, you can actually cure it. Uh, and a good chunk of folks get one shot and the trigger goes away. Uh, there's a smaller substance, the second shot, and then it goes away. Uh, and then if you get a couple shots and that doesn't do the trick, then sometimes you can move on to the surgery. Uh, but uh, the success rate is pretty high uh, for those uh, non-diabetic uh, folks uh, and the non-diabetic trigger fingers. It's got a pretty sing uh, a six a high success rate of 60 or 70 percent, one shot and you're, and you're good to go. Uh, that, that rate unfortunately does drop in folks who have diabetes. And that's just the nature of the beast of diabetes. It changes the, the makeup of your soft tissues and how we respond to things. Uh, so it's a little bit lower uh, in terms of a success rate uh, from that standpoint. Operative intervention. Uh, if you're going to have a surgery, uh, a trigger finger release is kind of the type of surgery that you would hope to have uh, in the grand scheme of things. It's a very minor little same day procedure. Uh, you could do it under local anesthesia if you really wanted to, which means that you just numb the area up. Uh, you don't have to have a breathing tube. There's no anesthesiologist involved. Uh, and you kind of drive yourself to the little procedure and you drive yourself home and you're, you're good to go. Uh, but the operative treatment, all the same, we don't usually jump to that. Uh, it's indicated after we don't respond to conservative management with those injections. Uh, it may be the first line treatment in locked trigger fingers uh, or in folks who have uh, diabetes. Uh, sometimes they won't respond to those injections. So we move on to the next step. Uh, and basically what the surgery does, we are basically, uh, in orthopedics, we are basically glorified carpenters. Uh, so we don't, we don't do anything fancy in most instances. Uh, in this case, we are basically just opening up that tunnel system so that the tendon doesn't get uh, caught on anything anymore. Uh, so we kind of take, and uh, this is a, a, about as gruesome as the pictures get, so it won't be anything beyond this. Uh, but uh, this is just an example of a, of a trigger finger release. Um, th there's a, you make a little incision on the skin. <clears throat> and again, that's that area where we usually have the pain because of triggering. Uh, and then you, make, you get down to the flexor tendon. This little cloudy area on top is actually the, ten or the uh, pulley. We call it a pulley or, or the, uh, the roof of the tunnel itself. And then you just make a little incision in that. And this, is, this picture on the right is just showing uh, the tendons uh, delivered. Uh, through the palm. Uh, and then once you do that, uh, you're good to go. Uh, there's mechanically nothing that the uh, the tendon uh, will catch on anymore. So it kind of takes the uh, trigger away. So kind of a nice, quick uh, and easy uh, little procedure. So uh, linked to trigger fingers, uh, we are going to get into our fun bonus topic, bonus topic, everyone, uh, of uh, Dupuytren's contracture. So this is a really weird one. Uh, it's got an amazing uh, history to it, actually. If you Google this, we'll go through some of the fun stuff. But if you Google this, uh, you, can, you can go down the rabbit hole pretty quickly with Dupuytren's uh, uh, contracture and the history of it and where it came from. 
but it often gets confused with trigger fingers uh, so or vice versa. Uh, so we end up seeing a lot of folks for triggers, but it's actually dupatrins or if it's dupatrins and it's actually triggers. Uh, so dupatrins contracture, uh, and some of you may have it or, or have the beginnings of it, um, but it's very different than a trigger finger. And this, this picture shows it to you over here. It's, it forms these little cords and nodules uh, in the uh, finger, which ultimately pull your finger down into a flexed position. Uh, many of you may have seen these commercials. This has gotten very, very, uh, or this has popularized Dupuytren's contracture quite a bit. Uh, this, of course, is the one, the myth, the man, the myth, the legend, John Elway. Uh, he is, uh, you know, a, a professional football player, Hall of Famer, uh, does a lot of uh, broadcasting things now. But he had Dupuytren's contracture and uh, underwent a, a procedure for it, uh, and now has a bunch of commercials and things on on uh, TV, uh, kind of bringing uh, uh, to light uh, the Dupuytren's uh, disease. Uh, but uh, Dupuytren's contracture, again, getting back to the history of it, is pretty fascinating. Technically, it is it is also known as the Viking disease. So, uh, being from Minnesota, it pains me to put John Elway up on the uh, the old screen. So I had to put the Minnesota Vikings back up there. Uh, but unfortunately, this, of course, isn't the Viking that we are talking about when it comes to uh, Dupuytren's. Uh, we are talking a little bit more about these guys, uh, not the nice Vikings in Minnesota, but the, the semi semi uh, angry ones uh, back in Scandinavia back in the day. Uh, but the history of this is fascinating. So you can get Dupuytren's disease uh, or condition uh, sporadically, meaning that you can just get it for no rhyme or reason, without any history of anything, uh, but uh, it is very, very tied to anyone who has some Scandinavian heritage. And it doesn't necessarily even have to be Scandinavian heritage, namely because of this slide here. Uh, the Vikings back in the day, they, they were living up in the cold north here in Scandinavia, uh, and they did what they did, uh, and they went around and sailed and conquered huge chunks of Iceland and the Orkney Islands in Ireland and made their way through Europe, huge chunks down to even you know Italy and Greece, all, all around the Mediterranean. Uh, so anyone who has any history uh, around large chunks of European heritage is technically predisposed to getting Dupuytren's contracture. So I'm both uh, uh, Irish and Norwegian, uh, so I'm surprised I don't have Dupuytren's contracture yet, but I'm sure, sure it's uh, uh, coming down the pipeline uh, for me. Uh, but anyone who's doing Ancestry.com or anything, if you have any history uh, from Scandinavia or Ireland uh, in particular, you're predisposed to getting this. So the clinical presentation for this, it's different than the triggers. Again, the triggers usually will have full range of motion, but the finger clicks or locks. Uh, in Dupuytren's contracture, your palm makes these uh, fun little cords, uh, which actually just make their way down the finger and tether things down into a flexed uh, position. Uh, and an easy way to, to check for that is you just you look at your palm, you kind of rub your thumb across it or your fingers across it. You might feel little bumps uh, in the skin, uh, which can be the beginning of uh, Dupuytren's contracture. Or you might have something like this uh, on the left there uh, where you'll feel a big cord uh, or a big nodule and you'll notice that your finger gets pulled down. Uh, on the right side here, this picture is called a tabletop test. It's not a very imaginative name. Uh, but what you do is you place your finger or your hand flat on a table, uh, and if your finger looks like this and you can't lay the fingers flat down, uh, that's just another sign that you may have some sort of contracture or, or Dupuytren's disease. Uh, so that's an easy enough thing that we all can kind of do at home just to, just to look for uh, the presentation of it. Uh, the anatomy in Dupuytren's disease is, is wildly fascinating. Uh, if you're a dork like myself, uh, the fingers and the hands I have a crazy amount of moving parts. It's an unbelievably complex system of really small uh, pieces of tissue. And when they work in concert, it's a beautiful thing where everything works wonderfully and glides smoothly. Uh, in Dupuytren's uh, disease, it's not that anything breaks or tears or ruptures. Uh, you're actually taking the good normal tissue, which is just this green line of soft tissues making its way down the finger, and it turns it into a very lumpy mess of bad tissue. So it just takes that good stuff and turns it into bad stuff. Uh, and it's not involved in the tendons, it's not involved in the bone, it's its own separate beast of uh, abnormal soft tissue. Uh, so again, treatments split between the non-operative and the operative uh, interventions, the non-surgical treatments for this. Uh, it can include simple observation, we just watch it, 
Uh, you can continue range of motion. If it's not affecting you, it usually doesn't cause any pain. Uh, it doesn't turn into anything scary like a tumor or cancer or anything like that. So if it's not really bothering you, we often just watch it. Uh, if it is bothering you or you're finding that it's difficult to shake hands or grab objects or get your hands in your pockets because the fingers won't get out of the way, uh, then you can intervene. Uh, one option is to do an injection of collagenase. Uh, collagenase is just an enzyme uh, that eats away at the tissue that makes up the cord. Uh, so it's a nice non-operative uh, management where you just do an injection or in some cases where it's a little bit more severe uh, and we we base that off of how much of a contracture you have uh, the mp joints uh, are the main knuckles that connect the fingers to the hand and then the pip joints or the dip joints are the little knuckles in your fingers so if you have a, a 30 degree contracture of your fingers at the mp joints or any contracture in your finger uh, you technically are a candidate for surgery as well uh, and it's it, it's an excision of the bad uh, tissue you just simply take it out uh, and it always looks a little funny we get these fun zigzag incisions but the beautiful thing about our hands is that it, got, it has a wonderful blood supply to it so things heal really well and the scars eventually just kind of disappear and soften uh, and most people can't really even uh, tell you you had surgery uh, when all is said and done so that is Dupuytren's contracture, a fun little thing that often gets con uh, confused for the trigger fingers, uh, but is uh, obviously very different. So be careful of your Scandinavian heritage uh, out there. Uh, next topic uh, we'll go through is thumb arthritis. Uh, this is a very, very common uh, uh, finding in all of us. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, we use our thumbs obviously all day long for absolutely everything. Uh, pinching, gripping, keys, coffee cups, everything that you could possibly think of, uh, you use your thumb for, uh, which is wonderful. It's what sets the human race uh, apart from most other uh, things, uh, but uh, it comes at a cost uh, and that thumb joint wears out quite quickly uh, for us. Uh, so what exactly is arthritis? Uh, many of you out there probably have or have had various forms of arthritis in the past. Uh, arthritis basically means uh, that the cartilage on your joints, which is nice, it's like a pillow top on a mattress, nice soft stuff. It allows our joints to glide smoothly. In a normal joint, everything works very nicely as it does on this picture on the left. Uh, in an arthritic joint, we wear away at that nice pillow top and the cartilage gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And then you get uh, what we often will refer to as bone on bone arthritis. So the bone on bone just refers to us describing things where the x-rays we take, you, you lose the space between the joints and then the two bones are touching each other, which generates a lot of inflammation and a lot of pain uh, and it causes us a, a lot of trouble. Uh, so again, that's very common, unfortunately, at the base of our thumb. Uh, and the basilar joint, which is what we call it, is uh, the joint of your thumb that's all the way down kind of in the palm. Uh, there's a joint that bends your knuckle in your thumb. There's another joint that bends the thumb near the hand. And then the base of it, the basilar joint, is the one down uh, below that. Uh, and that's technically the second most common spot we get arthritis outside of the little tips of our fingers. But, but it is far and away one of the most common spots we all, we all get arthritis. And it can be very debilitating. This is a tricky one. Again, we use our thumbs for absolutely everything. So pinching and gripping uh, becomes difficult, opening jars. Uh, there are lots of things that we don't really think about uh, in our daily lives uh, that can get in the way because of uh, the uh, arthritis in your thumb. Uh, but it creates a lot of pain with those activities uh, and it creates this horseshoe uh, area of pain uh, around our hand and our palm. It starts through the palm and wraps its way around the hand and goes all the way up to the backside of the hand as well. Uh, but that's pain even at rest. Uh, it bothers people at night, bothers people during the day. It certainly bothers people with activities. Uh, but the two most common things we hear folks talk about is either keys uh, or jars. It's it really hard to open jars because the arthritis uh, gets very, very stirred up uh, as we pinch things. Uh, the physical exam is pretty, uh, it's kind of a slam dunk when you see someone with bad arthritis in the thumbs. Uh, this person here in this picture uh, on the right uh, is a later stage arthritis, but this is what uh, thumb arthritis tends to do to our hands. Uh, it gives you something called a sh shoulder sign or something we call a shoulder sign. Uh, and basically what ends up happening is that we get so much arthritis at the base of our thumb 
that when we try to move our thumb, it gets locked down because of the bone on bone. It's like sticky Velcro that just sticks it together. Uh, and then we have to still try to use our hand. So the, the metacarpal in your hand gets kind of sucked into the palm uh, like this person here. And then the other joints kind of try to compensate by hyperextending. Uh, so we get this kind of Z shape uh, to our thumb uh, that kind of zigzags all over the place. Uh, and that's what that's just how our body is built. It tries to compensate through the arthritis and still allow us to reach our thumb backwards to be able to grab uh, and grip things. Uh, but it, it, it gets in the way and it causes a lot of uh, a lot of discomfort. Uh, and once you get to this point, it's one of those things where the cat, unfortunately, is kind of out of the bag uh, to speak. Uh, and it's it's trickier and trickier to uh, treat that. Uh, this is just a fun little series of x-rays uh, that again shows you the staging of it. Again, getting back to us being incredible dorks, uh, we classify everything uh, and we classify the thumb arthritis based on what the x-rays look like. So stage one is uh, a pre-arthritic uh, stage. That's not a very good description of it, but the pre-arthritis means that we have the pain, but not necessarily the bone changes on x-ray. So this is looking at the thumbs kind of top down. Uh, and the metacarpal of your thumb is that guy there uh, on the side. And we can see this big space around the joints. That's what we want to see. Uh, that space is all cartilage. Uh, so uh, that is what wears away and you get closer and closer to bone on bone. So then we just go down the, the next phases. Stage two, you start to get little bone spurs and a narrower joint. Stage three, you, just, you start to get true, true bone on bone uh, arthritic change. Uh, and that's just that little uh, arrow there. Uh, stage three is usually when uh, uh, it really starts to bother people. And usually when we start to get into the true uh, uh, treatments uh, for everything, but that's that bone on bone change uh, there at the basilar joint. And then stage four just gets worse from there. It starts at the basilar joint, but then the arthritis kind of creeps around to other little joints in your wrist and just gets worse and worse uh, for us uh, and gets a little bit trickier to treat uh, and more painful for folks. Uh, so again, splitting it up, this is the, the, the running theme tonight of orthopedics where we split everything up into operative uh, and non-operative treatments. Uh, non-operative treatments for us, uh, first and foremost, uh, is tricky because it just kind of comes on. Uh, there's not a great way to prevent arthritis from happening and there's a huge uh, hereditary or genetic component that is at play that we often don't give enough credit to. Uh, but that's the reason why some folks get arthritis very early. Uh, some folks never get it. Uh, and it's some, it's the reason why we can't really figure out how to prevent it because a lot of it is not uh, it, it's something that we can control, uh, unfortunately. But the best thing you can do, whether you have arthritis or not, is to keep things loose and moving. Uh, try to be as active as you can. The goal of uh, our job, uh, you know, as orthopedic surgeons is whether it's operative or non-operative is to uh, keep you folks moving and uh, feeling good and pain-free. So a lot of our treatments are aimed at taking care of uh, that discomfort in any way we can. Uh, the non-operative treatments for the uh, thumb arthritis start with things called short opponent splints. Uh, they're basically fancy little uh, fun splints. There's a million different types of them. Uh, this uh, picture up top is an example of one uh, that just slides on. It tries to be very low profile. Uh, it tries to support that thumb and the joint uh, so that when you're pinching or gripping against things, uh, the joint, the arthritic joint kind of doesn't bear most of the brunt, uh, but that brace uh, uh, does. Uh, then you can get into anti-inflammatories. Uh, again, we have to be pretty careful with anti-inflammatories. Uh, they, for arthritic conditions, these are technically, these get lumped into the chronic uh, condition phase. So it's not something that will magically just go away very quickly. Uh, so the last thing we want to do is cause other problems with our treatments. So if we do NSAIDs or the anti-inflammatories, uh, we can very much irritate our stomach to the point where we can get arthrit or uh, ulcers. Uh, or bleeding ulcers or other problems with our kidneys and other organs. So we have to be really cautious with those, uh, but they can be a nice little adjunctive uh, treatment. And then just like with any other arthritic condition, uh, steroid injections are always uh, a mainstay. Uh, this uh, can do a few things and it certainly can't do others, but it can offer you some uh, good pain relief. Uh, if you're having a lot of pain in the thumb, a steroid injection very much can take some of that away. Uh, it certainly can buy you time, uh, meaning that if you, if we had a discussion and I said, well, technically based on your x-rays and things, you would be a surgical candidate. 
uh, but we don't want to do surgery yet. Let's try a steroid injection. Hopefully it can give us many months or in some cases, many years of relief uh, without having to chase after the surgery yet. Uh, but uh, it cannot uh, uh, do what the steroid injection did for the trigger finger, which is to cure it. Uh, the steroids won't take away the arthritis, uh, so it's still there. It just tries to be a strong anti-inflammatory to make us uh, feel a little bit more comfortable. Uh, surgical treatment uh, is indicated when we don't respond to the non-operative management. Uh, if we've tried braces, uh, if we've tried uh, injections, and things still just are not feeling very good, uh, we move on to the surgical treatment, uh, which uh, is very, very elective. Uh, just like with a total hip or a total knee, it's nothing you ever have to do, uh, but it's a, it's a discussion to have with your, with your uh, surgeon uh, and to figure out if it's something that would uh, benefit you uh, in terms of uh, getting you back to what you want to be doing. So the operative treatments uh, are, uh, varied and there's a ton of them. Uh, this is a strange surgery where there are a million different ways to do it. Uh, so if you talk to 10 different people, you might get 10 different ways uh, that you would do it. Uh, but uh, there's only one thing that actually matters, which is why there are so many different options. It's kind of a personal choice. Uh, the common element leading to a good outcome uh, in terms of a surgery for the thumb is something called a trapeziectomy. So what the heck is a trapeziectomy? Uh, one of the little bones in our wrist uh, that the thumb sits on, and it's this red angry looking guy here, uh, is called the trapezium. So that is one, bone, one of the bones that is involved in the bone on bone part of uh, the thumb arthritis. So what the trapeziectomy does is, and this sounds very strange, uh, but we completely remove it. Uh, and you just completely take that trapezium out uh, and that makes everything happy. Uh, you remove the bone on bone part uh, and now you are just bone on something soft. Uh, and the way we kind of uh, have moved or the way I've kind of moved to do that is a little bit less invasive uh, than, than some, uh, but uh, we remove that trapezium uh, completely. And then we just make a little hammock. Uh, it's like a fun little hammock of sutures that suspends the thumb. Uh, and then in the empty space, uh, we put a little something called gel foam, which basically just dissolves in your body. And then your body turns it to scar. Uh, so you can have just a, a, a thumb uh, suspended on the little hammock of sutures on a nice piece of uh, soft tissue, uh, which is kind of a fun little surgery. Uh, but it's very strange to completely remove it. It's, it's actually a very tried and true method, a tried and true method, and, and people do uh, very, very well uh, from it. Uh, so we'll get into uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, this is a, a fun one as well because it's very, very common. Uh, carpal tunnel uh, syndrome uh, is uh, uh, named after the actual carpal tunnel. Again, we're not uh, the most imaginative of folks in orthopedics. Uh, but again, this is just a, a, a picture of uh, the bone anatomy uh, in your uh, hand. Uh, there are 27 bones in your hand, technically the two forearm bones not included, uh, but there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, so the carpal tunnel uh, is named after the carpal bones. Uh, so those, those are those eight little bones in our wrists. Uh, and the tunnel is just made on top of those uh, bones. So this is kind of looking at a cross section of our hand. Uh, the carpal tunnel technically is this little area uh, where the wrist turns into the hand. It's kind of the little muscles down here, uh, but the bottom part of your tunnel on the back side of your hand is made up of some of those eight little bones in your wrist. Uh, and then you have this very thick ligament uh, or what we call a flexor retinaculum on top of uh, the, uh, uh, the wrist uh, there. And that forms the roof of the tunnel. And then in the tunnel, uh, we have uh, all of the flexor tendons uh, that help you make a fist and move your fist around. Uh, and we also have the median nerve. Uh, the median nerve is one of the three main nerves that comes out of our neck and runs down our arm. Uh, it gives, it's responsible for a lot of things, uh, but in this case, it gives us a little trouble uh, because it sits very superficially on the top of the carpal tunnel right next to that roof. Uh, so when we get carpal tunnel, something comes along uh, and it squashes uh, the nerve uh, and gives us uh, uh, some trouble uh, uh, down the line. So it's all based on the median nerve anatomy. Uh, the nerves in our arm are very unique uh, because they, will, they carve out their own little area of real estate that they help to control. So each nerve kind of is responsible for uh, certain areas of sensation. Uh, in our hand, the median nerve is responsible in large part for the thumb, index finger, middle finger, and half of your ring finger. 
So in carpal tunnel syndrome, when the symptoms come on, you're gonna get numbness and tingling in those areas. It's not always all of those areas, but it's gonna be kind of that thumb side of the hand uh, that gets uh, involved. It also controls uh, some of the main muscles in your hand, in particular, what we call the thenar muscles uh, down here. You don't have to memorize what these are called, but uh, the thenar muscles are uh, the, the big lump of muscles on our thumb side of our palm. And those in large part are responsible for everything we do or most things that we do uh, with our thumb. So the trouble with carpal tunnel syndrome is that if it's, if it's around for too long, it can actually cause atrophy of those muscles. Uh, and lead to uh, uh, weakness, uh, so we can't pinch and we can't grip. Uh, and if it gets, if it sticks around long enough or gets bad enough, that it can actually cause irreversible changes. So that's why we we get excited about carpal tunnel syndrome and and want to kind of get on top of it early uh, before it gets to that point where it causes us long term trouble. Uh, so carpal tunnel syndrome itself is one of the most common compressive neuropathies of the arm. Uh, we call it a compressive neuropathy, again, making it sound fancier than it is. Again, it basically means that one of the nerves is being pinched and it's giving you symptoms down your arm. Uh, most cases, again, like a trigger finger, are idiopathic, meaning that there's no specific cause. Uh, it is more common it, technically in women uh, than in men, and the incidence of it does increase as we get older. Uh, other causes uh, for carpal tunnel syndrome can be related to other medical conditions, uh, things called ganglion cysts. Uh, if anyone out there has uh, heard of those before, uh, those are uh, little bubbles of joint fluid that make their way to the surface or to various areas of our hand or our wrist, uh, and they just pinch on the nerve themselves. Uh, arthritis can be a cause. Uh, pregnancy actually is a very common cause of carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, just due to fluid shifts, uh, both uh, uh, while we're pregnant and then while uh, or in the postpartum period. Uh, so that can cause a lot of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome uh, as well. Uh, and the main symptoms that uh, you folks should be looking out for are kind of a, a weird sensation where you have this burning uh, numbness or tingling in your hand. Uh, it's going to be in that median nerve distribution, so in the thumb, index, middle finger, part of the ring sometimes. Uh, some of us get swelling in the hand. Uh, some of us get an itch in the hand. It very, sounds very strange, but the nerve makes things feel like they itch, only you can't scratch the itch. It just sticks around. And once it starts to get bad enough, uh, we start to have trouble with kind of fine motor. So our handwriting gets a little worse. Uh, Folks, I mean, uh, coins, uh, buttons on our shirts, trying to button a shirt gets very difficult. Uh, so if you start to notice those things, it's kind of a red flag that you should probably get it looked at uh, and uh, have somebody take a peek at it just to make sure there isn't uh, something that we have to do uh, to fend it off. Uh, some of the physical exam uh, signs that we use in clinic, you technically can uh, do them on your own at home if you'd like, uh, but you tap. So again, that carpal tunnel on the underside of your palm, uh, you take your fingers and you tap along uh, that tunnel or along the forearm. Uh, and if you have a really flared up version of carpal tunnel, it's gonna send electric shocks shooting down your hand and down your fingers. Uh, and it will give us uh, kind of trouble with that. Uh, the other uh, exam test is called Phelan's test where we flex our wrist down or you can do kind of this where you squish your wrists down together. And that basically flexes your wrist and pinches that nerve uh, and causes uh, the carpal tunnel uh, to get a little worse. Uh, there is one thing that we will sometimes order, uh, which is one of the, uh, another little test that we can use. Uh, if you think about x-rays uh, being ordered uh, for diagnosing arthritis and looking at the bones, uh, something called an EMG uh, or a nerve conduction study or a, a velocity study, an NCV. Uh, these are weird little tests that send signals up and down our nerves and it can objectively give us a good amount of data on how well the nerves are working and if and where they are being pinched. Uh, so it can tease out whether or not we have carpal tunnel syndrome or how bad the carpal tunnel syndrome is or if we have a pinched nerve in our neck. So it's a nice little test uh, and it basically just looks at the nerves and tells us what side of this spectrum we're on, whether or not it's looking like the Kennedy over here uh, where it's jam packed, uh, you know, uh, bumper to bumper traffic and the signals aren't moving very fast and they're not moving very well or if it's something like beautiful bucolic uh, farmland in Minnesota. This actually isn't Minnesota, uh, but I'm, Minnesota looks like this sometimes. Uh, but the, the signals are traveling beautifully, nerve works lovely. Uh, it doesn't give us much uh, trouble. So again, staging across the board, it goes through mild, moderate, severe, or very severe. Uh, and the mild symptoms are just intermittent numbness, 
Uh, we might feel a little numbness and tingling throughout the day. Uh, it gets to moderate where you start to get more con consistent and constant numbness and tingling. Uh, it's often the scenario where we feel like we have to shake our hand out. We wake up in the middle of the night. Uh, you get night symptoms. You feel like you're constantly having to wake your hands back up or move your fingers to get the numbness to go away. And then you can get on the severe side of the spectrum, which is just worse symptoms uh, from mild and moderate, but you also get this uh, here in the picture, you get thenar atrophy. Uh, so that muscle in your thumb starts to weaken to the point where it atrophies and it starts to go away. So we'll get these divots uh, in our palm. So if anybody is looking at their hands right now and they have a little divot in their palm, uh, start to think about carpal tunnel syndrome. It might be a good idea to get it checked out uh, just because that means that things are, are progressing rather quickly. Uh, and we would want to intervene on that uh, uh, as quickly as we could. Uh, the treatments for this, again, uh, getting into the non-surgical realm, uh, we usually will always start conservatively with carpal tunnel syndrome outside of a few scenarios, uh, but most of the time the non-surgical treatment is uh, a night splint. Uh, it sounds strange, but a little brace to prevent our wrist from flexing down when we sleep. Uh, that's easy enough to do. We can hook you up with braces or Amazon or CVS, Walgreens, anything has a little wrist brace that you can wear. Uh, and then a steroid injection, same thing. A uh, little steroid injection tries to deliver the uh, anti-inflammatory just to the carpal tunnel itself, tries to calm down any inflammation in there, relax the nerve a little bit, and hopefully uh, give us some uh, good relief. Uh, and then the carpal tunnel treatment from an operative standpoint is a surgery. Uh, this is a carpal tunnel release, uh, much like the uh, trigger finger releases. If you are going to have a surgery, a carpal tunnel release is kind of the type that you would want to have. Again, you can do it uh, under local anesthesia only if you wanted to, or, or under a little twilight sedation, very much outpatient. Uh, we do that if you fail that non-operative management, including the injections and the bracing. Uh, and the, the surgery, again, isn't anything fancy, glorified carpenters. Uh, we basically take the roof of that tunnel and we make a little incision in it, which just opens it up uh, and it gives the nerve uh, some breathing room uh, so as not to uh, uh, cause uh, too much trouble uh, down the line. And then once you release that nerve, uh, the hope is that you uh, move on uh, just to let the pendulum swing backwards and for the nerve uh, to recover uh, itself. So I think we were gonna, we'll, we'll skip over uh, the tennis elbow. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions if anybody has about tennis elbow, but just in the uh, interest of time uh, so that we can uh, get to some questions, uh, we'll go on to some uh, take home points uh, for us uh, uh, now. Uh, just some quick, quick little hitters to remember uh, for the trigger fingers. Again, that's gonna be classically that clicking and locking, uh, the pain in the palm, pain with gripping, uh, an injection, think about an injection there, that's gonna uh, potentially cure it and get it to go away, which is lovely because there are a few things that we can get to go away just simply with injections. Dupuytren's contracture, a fun thing. Again, Viking, think Viking disease uh, and watch out for your Scandinavian roots. Uh, they'll come back to haunt you uh, later on. Uh, so that gives you the contractures of the fingers where they get pulled down, no clicking, no locking, not like the trigger fingers. Uh, but again, you can watch those or uh, consider uh, doing surgery for it. Uh, thumb arthritis, uh, that pain down at the base of the thumb, pain with pinching, gripping, opening jars. Uh, think about starting with injections or bracing. Uh, and then a little surgery can be very, very effective uh, in terms of getting you uh, back in action, much like a total knee or a total hip kind of gets you back in action pretty well. Uh, the thumb arthritis uh, surgeries are very, very successful uh, too. And then carpal tunnel syndrome, be mindful of uh, the uh, numbness and tingling in the thumb, index, middle fingers, a little bit in the ring. You feel like you're waking up, shaking your hand out all the time. Uh, think about carpal tunnel syndrome and having somebody take a peek at it uh, sooner rather than later, only because it can get to the point where you can have irreversible changes. So if at all you think about uh, uh, the fact that you have uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, then contact us and we'll, we'll uh, certainly take a peek for you. Uh, but that's it. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you for indulging uh, my mother's pictures here with my adorable Christmas elf, we'll call it. I'm not sure why, uh, but uh, yeah, thank you very much. If anybody has any questions at all, uh, we'll go through the, these now. You can always, I'm very chill and relaxed about uh, contacting me. So feel free to shoot me an email if anybody wants to or call the office. I'm certainly more than happy to see anybody at any time. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Sean. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you weren't able to address uh, tennis elbow but I do have uh, someone who wanted to ask a couple of quick questions. Um, how do you prevent re-injury of the elbow after recovering from tennis elbow? 
That is an awesome question. That's like the gazillion dollar question. Uh, the hardest part about tennis elbow. So in it, just for a brief, quick hitter, the tennis elbow is a tendonitis uh, to the common tendon that attaches on the outside of your elbow. So very common in racket sports, hence the name tennis elbow. It definitely doesn't come from that. Anything where you're gripping coffee cups and typing and things causes it. Um, re preventing re-injury, the treatments out of the gate for tennis elbow are a lot of therapy, stretches, you can do steroid injections, there are surgeries for it, but the, re the, the one thing I would encourage folks to remember, uh, and the one thing that the, the uh, physical and occupational therapists are really good about uh, drilling home to folks, are these things called nursal stretches. So the nursal stretches are not only great treatments, but they're a great way to prevent tennis elbow from happening again. So basically you keep your elbow as straight as you can keep it, and then you pull your wrist back and hold it for 10 seconds or so, and then you pull your wrist forward and hold it for 10 seconds or so. Do that when you wake up in the morning, do it before you play or work out, do it at red lights. I get people talking about doing it at all sorts of random times during the day, but that's an awesome way to not only treat tennis elbow, but also prevent it from trying to happen again. Great, thank you, thank you. And that same person asked, what is the difference between tendinitis and tendinopathy? Another great question. This is this is why we create. This is why we as physicians create problems in, in for folks because we tend to use fancier terms that are uh, that are used usually to describe kind of the basic science behind things. So tendonitis technically refers to the inflammatory process of uh, of the tendon. So you get these inflammatory cells that cause a lot of pain and inflammation around the area. That's the itis part. Uh, colitis you know, sinusitis, you get all sort of itises that we have in our body. It's just inflammation. Uh, the tendinopathy returns, uh, usually refers to the change in the tendon tissue itself. So it's not the inflammation, it's the, the way the uh, tendon tissue changes uh, and the, the cells and the tendon change. So it's more of kind of like a mechanical or a, a biologic uh, change to the tissue. But again, we, we, we tend to use them interchangeably, which causes trouble for folks. <laughs> for the rest of us, yes. Okay, here's another question. If a young teen with a radius ulna fracture is treated with ORIF, I'm guessing you know what that means, <laughs> the rod to the radius, will the rod mean, remain permanently? Uh, awesome question. So uh, yeah, both bone forearm fractures are very common. That just refers to where we have two bones in our form, the radius and the ulna. Uh, very common in young folks or higher energy adult injuries where we fall or get in a car accident, we break both of them. Uh, in young kids, we'll often use um, uh, these little fun things called titanium rods or, or wires. Uh, you can kind of think about it like rebar and concrete, where we will slide those rods down the inside of the bone, uh, and those hold the pieces if they're broken apart. It's like, imagine a pencil breaking in two, and then putting the pencil back together, and the pencil lead is an example of what the rod would be. Uh, usually in young people, uh, those rods will come out. Uh, we keep those in for somewhere around three to six months to make sure that the bone heals really well, and then we'll just take those out so that the, the young folks don't, um, don't have any hardware remained uh, in them. So usually those rods will come out. Cool. That's really mm -hmm. neat. All <laughs> right. Next question. Um, someone talks about a blue vein in their finger that gets very blue in the finger and hurts. Can you good. help someone understand that? That's a good question. There are a few things that can cause that, unfortunately. Most of them are very benign and safe. That is one of those strange things that looks very weird and scarier than it actually is. Uh, a lot of times that can either be related to, uh, there are various medical conditions that can cause it. If anybody's heard of something called Raynaud's uh, phenomenon or Raynaud's disease, that's a, a vascular uh, change in the little capillaries in our fingers where the, vas the vasculature clamps down either from outside forces or temperature changes and things. Uh, sometimes the blue, uh, the blue bubbles themselves in the fingers, if it's not related to anything else, can be something called a vascular malformation, which is like a bundle of veins basically in your finger. The, the venous blood or the blood in the veins uh, it has less oxygen in it than the than the arterial blood, which is red. So once we deliver the oxygen, the veins deliver the, take the blood out, but it's it's dark purple. It's kind of a darker color. But those bundles of of veins bundle or bunch up towards the surface, so it causes it to be purple. Uh, if it's causing pain, then I would encourage you to to look at it or have somebody look at it, because there are some cases where you have to remove those, uh, and it or it can continue to get a little bit worse or cause some other troubles. 
Um, so if it is causing you pain, uh, have it checked out. If it's not causing you pain, you can still certainly have it checked out, uh, but it might be something that you would just watch uh, from there. Great, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, Joy says, you Chicago represent. <laughs> nice, says, all right. <laughs> Where does Anvil fall after you top number four? <laughs> and then she says, because I guess you would get that. I don't get it, but I'm guessing that you would. That's fair. Uh, are you seeing more cases of carpal tunnel with more and more people using their computers, smartphones, and video game controllers all day? And what are some things people can do to prevent getting carpal tunnel, especially if they work all day at a computer and spend their evening doing things with their hands too, like knitting or something along those lines? Yeah, very good question. Uh, first off, Anvil, so for those who don't, aren't, deep diving in the heavy metal scene. Anvil it was an old school heavy metal band. They're actually still around. There's an awesome documentary about Anvil, actually, if anybody wants to uh, look for that. It's, I think it's called Anvil, but uh, they were a cool band. Uh, they I would put them lower on the list, Joy, but uh, I'll, I'll throw Anvil a bone. We'll, we'll give them some shout outs. <laughs> um, but uh, Carpal Tunnel is a tricky one, uh, only because uh, it can happen no matter what but it is it can be related and and each year or every few years the um academy of the orthopedic academy that is kind of the overarching uh uh entity for orthopedics uh puts out these um educational kind of things for us bullet points of what uh the treatments for different causes so carpal tunnel syndrome uh it can be linked to uh repetitive tasks such as typing uh, repetitive work tasks, if you're sorting something all day long, heavy machinery, uh, lots of different things can cause it. And we have seen, much like uh, tennis elbow, um, thumb arthritis, uh, carpal tunnel, trigger fingers, we've seen upticks of that during this weird year because we are all thrown out of our normal uh, sorts. And many of us are now working at home, not in a nice desk uh, set up uh, on laptops, which aren't the most ergonomic friendly things. So it can, it can raise the incidence of, of causing us to have tendonitis or carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, the, it's really hard to prevent that. The, a couple of things you can do to prevent carpal tunnel uh, is to be mindful of your posture. I am, you know, certainly don't do as I do because I'm a terrible example of it, but uh, a lot of our nerve issues, carpal tunnel included, comes because we're punched over all day long or we're sitting at a desk and typing away at a bad laptop so a lot of things you can do is to try to sit up straight and make sure your neck is back so you're not pinching your necks, uh, your nerves in your neck. Make sure for carpal tunnel in, in particular, try to have your hands relatively level when you're typing if this is looking at the side of you. We tend to either hike down when we type or the opposite where we're back like this because we're not at the right chair height or things, but prop some books under your laptop or things to try to bring your arms into a more even kind of keel uh, to try to prevent it. It's just preventative things from an overuse type of an injury. Uh, the modern day afflictions of iPhones and, you know, smartphones and iPads and video games certainly play a role, um, especially with thumb arthritis and tendonitis and all sorts of things. Not a great way around that one, unfortunately. Uh, that, that's kind of the modern day we live in, and especially as phones now are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, the screens are getting huge. So it requires us to reach our thumb over and hold it in a weird way. You can try to use... Um, Oh, they're a pot like pop sockets. If anybody knows what that is, they're those little like bubble, little nubbin things that go on the back sides of your phone where it lets you hold it in a little bit of a better way. Um, so you can try a lot of weird little preventative things, but it's, it's one of those things where you can be the most ideal person on the planet to try to do everything right. And some folks will still just get carpal tunnel. Um, but uh, for no lack of trying, you can, you can try some of those things. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this next person asks, what kinds of warm-up and stretching should athletes, such as a hockey player or dancers and Tai Chi players, do respectively to avoid injuries in their upper body and extremities? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the A lot of that comes down. To, so first off, make sure you are warming up and cooling down. Uh, we are all usually terrible at that, myself very much included. Um, not that I am, you know, playing hockey or anything these days, but if I go work out or go for a run, I am I just put my stuff on and get out there and go to town, which is like a surefire way to injure ourselves. So from an upper extremity uh, standpoint, though again, it sounds silly and I'll harp on it till the cows come home, but those inertial stretches for your arm, trying to keep that arm straight, stretch out those forearm muscles, 
uh, good stuff for the arms are like the cross body stretches where you're going you know side to side uh, windmills for the the shoulders uh, especially if you're doing any throwing or uh, like basketball uh, type stuff uh, that warms up your rotator cuffs uh, another good one is uh, that the therapists usually will have you do is we often get very tight in terms of reaching behind ourselves so things like seat belts in the cars or if you're reaching for like a person in the back seat um, it gets very tight to reach behind so the therapist will have you kind of put uh, your arm on it on like a door frame and you kind of lean into it so that you can kind of help gently stretch it backwards uh, but a lot of those uh, just kind of range of motion stretches are super super important uh, but again if you remember nothing else think of those inertial stretches just the act of getting your arm out there and stretching that can kind of loosen things up a lot and, and work on preventing uh, some of the, the downsides. Great, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. Someone asks, um, they play piano, and is that a good treatment for arthritis? Absolutely, yes. that is one of my greatest shames in life, I will let you know. My my parents wanted me to do uh, play piano when I was little, and I, I feel like I probably just dropped the ball or threw fits and refused to do it. Uh, but piano is amazing. We So I end up seeing a ton of musicians um, and musical instruments are amazing therapy uh, for your hands. Again, for arthritis, motion is great. Keep those fingers and thumbs and wrists and arms and everything else moving as much as you can. Uh, just because again, the arthritis is what it is. There's no way outside of surgery to take away the bone on bone. So while you have it, if we can make you comfortable, whether it's a steroid shot or therapy or anything, uh, keep it moving. So there, for, so piano is amazing, keeps everything going. So even if it aches a little bit, you're probably benefiting yourself more uh, by keeping the piano going or playing guitar or whatever whatever you prefer to play. But yeah, very important. It's a good Great, question. Great, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Okay, this uh, Helene says she had a cat bite in early June, and I realize that this is a little bit more of a personal question, but I thought it was quite <laughs> interesting. Um, the outer appearance healed, Range of motion, however, is painful and handwriting is getting worse. Do you have any suggestions? And then it says, the owner didn't think the bite was serious. She's a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Never trust a doctor. Never trust a doctor. No, no. Uh, so uh, cat bites are interesting. Uh, animal bites in general are interesting because the, and cats in particular, we end up seeing a lot of cat and dog bites um, and their teeth are like little hypodermic needles. So even though they, it doesn't seem like it's a big injury, uh, the, the tooth can go really deep down into your, into your hand and the mouth of any uh, humans, animals, anyone in general is filled with weird bacteria. So you can get very specific uh, bacterial infections based on cat bites. Uh, and the trouble with your hand is that there's not a lot of extra stuff. It is like a beautifully designed machine where nothing has gone to waste and there isn't a lot of protection from the skin right down to tendon right down to bone right down to joints so even a little scrape from a tooth can deliver the bacteria pretty deep in there mm -hmm. um, it's good to hear that you know usually if something spills out of control it gets red it gets hot you'll get red streaks moving all over the place because of the infection so i'm glad to hear that it, it did improve but the the deeper soft tissues sometimes remain very inflamed or angry uh, which causes the stiffness, which causes the pain. Sometimes there is a like a little indolent or a little hidden uh, amount of the bacteria that is still in your hand. So sometimes that's something to look into. Uh, so if it is bothering you, especially if it's been a few months, I might, yeah, I would encourage you to to go in and get it checked out. Even if it, even if you know we say, oh, everything looks good, and we're just gonna maybe do a little therapy or or try to massage it out that's peace of mind just to make sure that there isn't something more significant kind of going on but uh, yeah maybe get it checked out cat bites are brutal cats are are finicky beasts uh, but yeah tricky right, thank you yeah i didn't yeah. think about that but of course you probably see a lot of different kinds of bites we definitely do definitely do <laughs> yeah very good all right uh rebecca says why are the arthritic hand injections so painful that is a good question as well. Uh, so the and it's like it, it boils down to a couple things. Uh, one is the size of the joints in our hands uh, or our wrists are are very small, um, so there's not a lot of extra room uh, for the fluid. Uh, so we often use a smaller amount of the fluid, anyways. But uh, if you think about getting an injection in your shoulder or in your knee, uh, there's a lot of open space. Uh, 
Uh, so there's a, a, a lot of space for that fluid to kind of go into the joint, which doesn't balloon things up and cause pain. Uh, the other tricky part with the hand is that by design, uh, we are built to touch and feel and experience the world through our hands. So when we have a problem in our hand, it is very noticeable and is very painful. Uh, and when we chase after you with uh, a needle and an injection, it, you, you certainly feel that as well. Uh, but the hope is that we try to minimize that uh, discomfort with a few little tricks that we do in clinic. Uh, and the hope is that, the long-term hope is that that short-term uh, little poke uh, uh, equates to a longer-term kind of uh, subsidence of the pain. Um, but yeah, the hands are not, not, not super comfortable to get injections in. Gotcha, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. How about oral prednisone? Does that help with pain? Uh, it can. Uh, a lot of times we will use something called a Medrol dose pack, uh, which is a version of prednisone. Uh, it's called methylprednisolone. It's basically the same thing, uh, but it comes in like a six, five, four, three, two, one tapered dose. Uh, and that you can think about that kind of like a, a steroid shot just in pill form, uh, which tries to just douse the flames. So that can be a very good uh, first line treatment. You have to be a little tricky with the oral steroids because if you have diabetes, it makes your blood sugars jump quite a bit. Uh, and if you are on a blood thinner of any kind, it can mess with the effects of your blood thinner. So not everybody can take the oral steroids. Uh, and in those cases, sometimes the shot is kind of the lesser of all evils. So it's a little bit easier and, and safer to take an, a, a shot uh, from there. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, is there any progress on stem cell therapy instead of surgery? Uh, yes and no. Uh, that's an awesome question. There are always advances in the biologic uh, realm. That ultimately is kind of where things are hopefully headed. Um, the uh, Again, we're kind of glorified carpenters, but the ultimate goal is that there's going to be some way for us to regenerate cartilage and reverse time and make things feel much better. Uh, there are certain shots called uh, PRP injections or platelet-rich plasma, which is probably the most mainstream of all the biologic injections. Uh, that is an interesting injection where you draw a little vial of your own blood and you spin the blood down and you collect uh, all the fancy uh, healthy growth factors and then you inject that back in. Uh, so it's less of a steroid anti-inflammatory, it's more of like a biologic treatment. Uh, there certainly are other injections that um, you can get to that are various forms of stem cell injections. Uh, they're harvested from your own body or from other areas, uh, not from your own body, uh, that you can inject. The data, unfortunately, right now is a little hit or miss. So I owe, and, and that's the main reason why many of those injections are not covered by insurance. Uh, because the data often hasn't shown that it is better than a plain old steroid injection or even placebo in some uh, effects. And those stem cell injections, especially if you go up the, up to the upper echelon stem cell injections, they can be wildly expensive to the tune of thousands of dollars in injections sometimes. And I always encourage people to have a very healthy uh, level of skepticism when it comes to things like that. If anything is being very heavily marketed as this is a cure-all panacea and all it takes is three injections, each injection's $2,000 and come to see me and I'll 100% guarantee that it'll work. Uh, that's never ever the case. So be very careful of that. Uh, and unfortunately there are certain areas of the country or of the world uh, where they, are, they tend to target certain audiences there are lots of these clinics in Florida, for example, uh, where I know a lot of my patients spend some time during the winters uh, that are looking for people who maybe have a little bit of extra income and can pay for these injections. But always, it works for some, but the data hasn't really been shown to, to be all that effective yet. Got it. Thank you. That's, that's a good, good, solid answer. Uh, <laughs> there are several questions about cracking your knuckles. Yeah. Uh, does it cause arthritis? Can it lead to the hand problems you discussed? Um, should parents advise kids not to do it? That kind of thing. What are you? And I, f I feel bad. You don't have any time to breathe. So no, no, I you're good. Make it longer good. if you want. No, no, it's totally fine. Uh, so uh, knuckle cracking is a fun one. I actually did a little video on this. I will, I'll try to link it to my web uh, or the IBJI website. I think it's up on the blog somewhere. But uh, about knuckle cracking, uh, get I get asked that all the time. And it's usually by parents kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge, tell my kids not to crack their knuckles because it's bad for you. 
Uh, unfortunately, it does not cause any trouble for us. Uh, the cracking of the knuckle is kind of like it. Uh, the joint is a very kind of compact little vacuum sealed area. So cracking your knuckles, pop, it creates a little gas bubble that then explodes and creates the knuckle crack. Um, but it, the, it hasn't been shown to lead to arthritis or any troubles down the line. Uh, but that being said, if, it, if you have pain and you're doing it because it's painful, it, it, it can be like a, if you have a bad bruise, somebody comes and punches your bruise over and over again, it makes it worse and makes it more painful. So if, it's, if it hurts when you crack your knuckles, don't do it because it can make things worse. But some people, it's just kind of that nervous tick where you crack your knuckles and it's, it, it doesn't cause any trouble. <laughs> me. <laughs> good it's to very know, I've never had any issues, so that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, you're safe. You're safe. <laughs> Huge. Good. Good. Now, now I can tell everyone that too. <laughs> All right. Someone else asks, what are your thoughts about acupuncture? Uh, yeah, acupuncture is great. Uh, it's one of those holistic things that uh, often doesn't, it's getting more and more uh, mainstream. Uh, and even now, uh, some of the insurance plans are picking up uh, the tab on more of the alternative medicine type stuff, uh, because there is uh, there is some uh, data out there that, that shows that it definitely helps. Uh, so acupuncture certainly is not going to cause, as long as you go to someone who you know is, is reputable and kind of knows what they're doing, uh, it's definitely not going to cause any harm. Uh, and some people swear by it. And again, we're looking, all of us in life are just looking for things to help us in our time of need. And acupuncture is a great very minimally invasive alternative treatments to other medical uh, uh, things. So if if you have the means and you have a, a, a someone to, who can do it for you, uh, give it a try. Uh, and if and it works awesome for some, it it doesn't work very well for others. But again, it's not going to cause any trouble. So if you try it and it works, that's an awesome kind of arrow to have in your quiver uh, for it. Great, great, thank you. Um, and there are a lot more questions, but it's getting later, faster. So I'll ask you one last one, which I thought was kind of interesting which is how important is it to use an X-ray to help guide the injection into a joint? Uh, it, it depends on the injection. It depends on the area that you are injecting rather. That's a better way to put it. Um, for uh, most of the upper extremity and uh, most of the lower extremity, uh, like a knee injection, uh, a shoulder injection, uh, elbows, wrists, fingers, uh, it is not overly important. Um, most of those injections, you can very easily feel uh, or palpate uh, uh, with just manual exam. So that's why that's the most common way we do it. Um, you can, uh, certain injections in the back, for example, uh, in the hip, um, ankles, uh, neck, uh, a little bit more complicated. You have to kind of target things and it's not as easy to palpate on yourself those areas. So the, the image is used to guide the needle into the appropriate spot there. Um, but we often won't use uh, image guidance for uh, most of our injections. Um, it is a tr it, it's a tricky thing because some, it, some people will use the image guidance uh, as uh, an alternative to, uh, to bill a little bit more uh, for it. So it's, it's, a little, uh, it's a little unnecessary in most cases. Um, but uh, it's not going to cause any harm, obviously, but most of the injections don't require uh, image guidance for it. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. And as I said, there were more questions. Um, there were a few more people who were interested in learning more about tennis elbow um, yeah. and that type of thing. So maybe we could hit you up to come back again sometime. Of course, that's a big topic. Time. We could do a whole, a whole talk on uh, tennis elbow for sure. That's what I was thinking. So that would be great. So again, yeah. Dr. Sean, thank you very much. And no I want problem. to let everyone who's still on the line know um, to thank you for joining us this evening and mark your calendar for the next IBJI talk paired with uh, the North Suburban YMCA called Knee and Hip Pain and Treatment Options with Dr. Sean Sutfin, which will be on Wednesday, October 28th at 7 p.m. Um, but, but in the meantime, thank you, Dr. Sean. This was really great, really informative. Um, again, thank you for listening to the questions and really taking your time to answer them. Uh, we really appreciate your time tonight and the whole IBGI team. Thank you, all you behind the scenes people as well for making this happen and making it work smoothly. Thanks again, Dr. Shong. And um, his, his contact information is on the page. So if you need to reach out to him, please feel free to do so. Again, all thanks, right. Dr. Shong. Thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. No worries. Thank you all. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye now. Bye.